Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Russian forces continue to gather close to Ukraine's eastern and northern borders. And still, the world waits to see what Vladimir Putin's endgame is. If the goal is to wring security concessions out of the U.S. and its NATO partners, does he have any chance of success? Well, my guest is Gabrielius Landsbergis, Foreign Minister of Lithuania, on the front line of NATO-Russia tensions. Why is this small Baltic state making so much noise as the superpowers square up? Gabrielius Landsbergis in Vilnius, welcome to Hard Talk. Hello, good evening. It's nice to have you on the show, Foreign Minister. Just a few days ago, you said of Ukraine, you said we are convinced that a real war is a likely possibility. The diplomacy is still continuing. Are you now dialing down your rhetoric about war? Well, the uh, our observations about uh, about war is from uh, what we see on the ground. Uh, the troops are still gathering, and not only on Ukrainian border, but also in Belarus. Uh, and uh, apart from troops, there are equipment, armament, everything that is needed for, for an actual war. So if Putin wanted to create a credible threat, I think that he's really getting there, so that we, the neighbors of, of Ukraine or countries in the region, we truly believe that uh, he's uh, actually have these in, intentions. But that doesn't mean that we do not trust that diplomacy can still prevail. Actually, as we've seen in the past, you know, even when the war uh, starts, sometimes diplomacy still um, continues. Right. I, I just wonder if you're getting the tone right, if you're actually being helpful with all of this talk of the likelihood of war, because... Uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, says, look, we do not need to panic. And his uh, advisor to, to the chief of staff said, uh, constant, extremely emotional messages, how a big war is going to start tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or the day after that. They create real economic risk for us. So maybe you need to rethink. Well, you know, we when we are speaking and I'm talking, you know, not only as uh, uh, as a Lithuanian, but also someone coming from the Baltic region. Uh, when we are talking about issues of security, we talk about our security as well. And we think that we are already in a different situation than we've been, let's say, in last, uh, last year's October. Because the, the buildup of troops and the so-called exercise in, in Belarus, uh, where Belarusian and Russian troops will be actively exercising since uh, starting from 10th of February, actually they, uh, they affect our security. If the troops would remain after the 20th of February on Lithuanian border, on Polish border, that creates a security deficit in our region. And this is also a very important point that we are we're here as a, a Baltic states politicians are trying to make, that uh, Russia is not only threatening Ukraine, it's, it wants to change the security architecture of, of the whole region, and that directly affects us. Mm. We'll talk more about that. I just wonder whether you feel that uh, Lithuania feels that as a member of NATO, that the NATO alliance right now has got the cocktail of responses to Putin right, because that cocktail basically involves sending troops. Biden's announced he's sending a, new, a few thousand extra troops to Eastern Europe in the next few days, sending some military equipment, and you in the Baltic states are sending limited military equipment to Ukraine, and then talking very, very tough about sanctions that will follow any Russian military operation. Do you think the cocktail as it stands is the right one? Well, basically, we are in, in the situation that was created not by us. And some of us are scrambling the old history books and trying to look for the lessons learned from the Cold War time or the, the things that happened after the Cold War and looking for the answers, uh, the right answers to the situation. 
I'm, I'm convinced that there are a couple of things that are needed to be done. First of all, we need to, uh, we need to send support to Ukraine, and only, not only with words and, and uh, nice thoughts. It has to be real, it has to be practical. Then we need to reinforce the countries that have, as I mentioned, that what we call a security deficit. And we're seeing that the United States are doing exactly that. Currently, the countries that are affected the most, they are reinforced first. We expect that uh, Baltic states uh, would, would, uh, would follow. Then when we're talking about sanctions, if we are expect and we, if we tell that they have to be unbearable, they have to be unbearable. Therefore, in Lithuania, we rarely talk about the possibility of red lines being that, you know, Mm, the things that we would not do in case of an actual attack against Ukraine or an Anschluss of, of Belarus. Basically, all options need to be on the table because we don't know what specific action uh, Putin and his troops might, uh, might be thinking of. And you, what do you mean by that? I mean that, uh, in, in effect, many of us uh, in, uh, in, in Western countries, we think that, uh, that Belarus is already law has already lost its sovereignty. But uh, before, um, in last year and, and after, uh, after the election in 2020, there were no permanent uh, Russian troop bases in, in Belarus. Belarus still maintained its own border control. But what we're seeing now, the troop buildup is so massive that basically it changes the situation in Belarus quite dramatically, especially if we see that, uh, that the troops remain. And then the question is, and, and will be posed, whether is Belarus still a sovereign country? So, getting back to the question of whether NATO's got it right, I just wonder, when you say things like the battle for Ukraine is going to be basically a battle for Europe, whether you think NATO ruling out sending fighting troops to Ukraine itself is the right strategy? Well, I think that Ukraine has all the potential to defend its country, its territory. I don't think that it, uh, the country has enough time and resources currently to arm itself. Therefore, this is the, the, main, uh, the main point that we need to, uh, to cover. And uh, as, you've, as you've mentioned, Lithuania and other Baltic states, we're doing our part. And we know that uh, we cannot do a lot, but uh, maybe we're sending the right signal to, to other partners in, in the West, what should be done. Right. But if, if you are meaning by that, that you want to see the US and European partners ramping up weapon supplies to Ukraine in short order, that is precisely Russia's point, that what NATO is doing is representing a new level of threat on Russia's border in Russia's neighborhood. And that is not only unacceptable, it also breaks promises made to Russia about what NATO would do in Eastern Europe going back to 1990. Well, I think that we need to separate a few things. Uh, allowing people and making sure that they would be able to defend their own country is not a threat to anybody. Basically, it's an assurance that uh, the country will stand for what it believes it's vital for it. And I think that it would go for, for any country. You, you seriously think that, that these level of, of armaments being sent to Ukraine and the thousands and thousands of extra troops to be deployed by NATO in the countries of Eastern Europe, which of course were once part of the Soviet sphere of influence, you seriously think that won't be regarded as threatening from Moscow? Look, I think that what is already threatening is Russian troops that are already on, on uh, Belarusian and Lithuanian border. Uh, what I think is threatening is the occupied Crimea. What I think is threatening is uh, troops in Transnistria, in Abkhazia, in Ossetia, uh, in, uh, in, in parts of uh, Ar Ar Armenia and, and elsewhere. I think these things are, have been uh, threatening the stability and security for a very long time. And to add to that, in two, since 2008, when actual borders, first, uh, for the first time in a very long time in the, well, broader European region were, were crossed, this is what is actually threatening. Right, but and I want you to address 
Vladimir Putin's sense of recent history. He is convinced that going back to 1990, the Western powers, NATO, gave promises. Maybe they were oral promises, but they were promises nonetheless that NATO would not militarize the area which was, till then, the former Soviet empire. What we now see is militarization by NATO. In, in fact, let me ask you something specific about Lithuania. There are two influential MPs who have written a report in Lithuania saying that what they want to see is a permanent U.S. battalion-size military base put by Washington, D.C. on your soil. Is that your desire, your strategy? Well, I, I can say that with everything that I mentioned, with a country that is actively uh, acting as an aggressor against its neighbors and thinking of uh, myriad of arguments why does it need to behave the, the way there is only one thing that can make uh, the people of Lithuania the people of Latvia Estonia and other countries more safe and secure is having our partners with us defending our territories probably this is the, the single most important thing that happened uh, since uh, our regaining of our independence joining EU is joining NATO and having the fifth uh, article uh, and our partners defending us. So you because wanted. So just to be clear, you want to turn your country into a major military, a permanent military base for the United States. We believe that our partners uh, helping us defend our countries basically saves us from any attempts by Russia to try something adventurous on our borders. There are those who discuss in Lithuania, and not, not so few of them, that if not for NATO, uh, wouldn't we have a similar uh, situation like, like happened in 2008 in, in Georgia? Mm -hmm. Because military ad adventurism is really likely, especially in those countries who are not, not part of NATO. Right, so we believe... I mean, yeah, you, yeah I, I, I hear your point. I mean, but I'm mindful you're the foreign minister. You believe, I, I'm sure you believe in the power of diplomacy and the power of compromise. The Russians are insistent and they, they've said that the recent U.S. response to their demands about a pullback of NATO from Eastern Europe is inadequate. They've said because the key question as far as Moscow is concerned is being ignored. And Lavrov puts it like this. The U.S. and its allies have to understand the principle that they cannot strengthen their security at the expense of another country's security, i.e. Russia's. Are you prepared here and now to tell me that you're listening to Russia, you understand what they're saying, and that there are some concessions you and NATO partners can make? Look, when you said that, uh, you know, Putin wants to, to bring the world back to 1990s, I think that, you know, we need to uh, really look even more back. Uh, to their concerts of powers where, you know, big powers were divided, dividing the map into their zones of influence. And I, I'm absolutely sure that these times are way, way, way over. Uh, we have to be sure and to make sure that the countries can themselves choose their security options. It's not about zones of influence. Actually, if mm. Russia wants to be serious about what it's saying, first of all, the troops need to be um, withdrawn from the territories that it currently keeps under occupation. And I'm talking about eastern Ukraine, I'm talking about Crimea, uh, territories of Georgia, and territories of Moldova. This is where any sort of meaningful debate right. would, be, you know, would be started. You're taking a tough stand. And uh, I just wonder whether you're worried that uh, NATO and the European Union are not united around the tough talk that you're giving me. I mean, if one looks at Berlin, for example, we see a German government that is adamant it will not send weapons to Ukraine. In fact, they're limiting it to a field hospital and a few thousand helmets. And we hear the Croatian president say that actually... Ukraine has no place in NATO. So you guys in Europe and in NATO, you are very far from united. Well, <laughs> well, seeing you guys looks like, you know, we've spent so much time apart, but that's not, not long ago that we were, not you guys, but all of us guys. And I still believe that the Western um, 
uh, Western community will find an answer because it's not about the divisions in, in Europe that Putin is looking at. What he would really like to achieve is divisions within the broader community between EU, uh, UK and US. Try to find the differences, try to find what divides us and then show to the rest of the world that look, these guys cannot you know, make up their minds how tough or not tough they want to be. Well, th th Talking that's, isn't that, to a certain extent, that is true. Let's just take one specific. You talked about unbearable sanctions being brought to bear yes. on the Russian economy if Putin makes a move, another move, in U Ukraine. The truth is, Germany, for example, has expressed deep disquiet about the possibility that Russia be blocked from access to the SWIFT international financial transaction system, because they worry it would do too much damage to the general international uh, financial system. Again, unbearable sanctions, it's not going to happen. Well, that's the point I, I made before, uh, that coming from my government, uh, where we have the position that no red lines have to be drawn uh, for when we're talking about, about the sanctions, because it sends not the best signal to, to Moscow. We need to be open about a number of possibilities depending on what Russia is doing. That means that uh, we would have a broader spectrum of answers to the developing situation. Um, I've read uh, the resolution from, from Congress, and uh, maybe you've seen that as well. It also has a few lines about the possibility to, to ban uh, the imports of oil, coal, and many other um, extracted uh, goods from, from Russia. But it also has a line that it should not uh, destroy the uh, global supply lines. So basically, they, what they're saying is that we really need to look at all options and put them all on the table. But then again, at the end of the day, you know, if it's damaging more, uh, particularly more to the, to the countries who are imposing those sanctions, and maybe the, some, some balance could be, could be found. But this sort of discussion is ongoing not only in Germany, but in many, many, many other places. Do you think it's wise for Lithuania to be tweaking Moscow's tail in so many different ways at the same time? Your, your tough talk on the Ukraine crisis, but also you've turned your country into essentially a sort of dissident base for Belarusian uh, politicians who have had to flee from Lukashenko's dictatorship and of course uh, you are a very strong loud advocate of regime change now in Belarus and you also have offered safe haven to one of Alexei Navalny's uh, biggest sort of allies in his political movement which of course is profoundly anti-Putin. How far are you going to take your determination to do what you can against Putin? When, when there's a choice between the oligarchs and dissidents, we choose dissidents, so that's that. Right, but you're a country of 2.8 million people, and right now you've taken on one heck of a diplomatic commitment fight, because not only are you involved in these sort of wars of words and hostilities with uh, Russia in diplomatic terms, but you've taken on a feud with China at the very same time. And you personally have been at the forefront of that with your decision to allow the Taiwan government to open up a representative office, which they're calling the office of Taiwan rather than Taipei, which is the usual diplomatic formulation. Why did you choose to confront Beijing like that? Well, we didn't choose to confront uh, Beijing, uh, allowing uh, Taiwanese to open the office under exactly that name. Uh, I think that, well, you know, you, it was... you did choose, because everybody else in Europe still uses this weird diplomatic formulation office of Taipei. You decided to, to end that and to just say outright, it's the office of Taiwan. It's the office of Taiwanese, uh, Taiwanese people. Uh, maybe we, we are drawing some um, inspiration from the agreement that was signed between uh, uh, the PRC and United States in 1979, which said that the people of uh, uh, United States can have uh, cultural and economic relations with, uh, with people of Taiwan. So uh, for us, uh, the Taiwanese representation means exactly that. And uh, we are 
uh, we're upset that uh, you know the, the big country as uh, like like PRC is upset about that. Well, are, are you upset also that you misread the scale of the Chinese reaction? Because your own deputy foreign minister, Mr. Adamenis, has said. China has responded not only bilaterally with all of the, 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 the trade uh, sanctions that they've placed on Lithuania, but they've also imposed de facto sanctions on the EU single market by targeting any other businesses across Europe that have Lithuanian sort of components as part of their products that they're trying to sell to China. So you've created a, a big problem for other people in Europe, and it seems it's spiraled out of control in a way that you never imagined. Well, that's one way to put it, uh, but I would like to rephrase it, that it's not us who did something wrong. We never did anything illegal. It's China decided to escalate it to the, to the single market. And actually, this is why the consultations in WTO are started. Yeah, but, but with respect, you, you say you did nothing wrong, but your own president says that you made a mistake with this name change, and he wants you to take it back. So you can tell me on hard talk. Are you prepared to say, yeah, I got it wrong. This is too much pressure on Lithuania. We're going to change the name to Taipei. Well, I'm glad to, to correct you there that uh, we have an agreement with the president uh, that we are not taking the name back, and uh, it stays, uh, because we are convinced that we did nothing illegal, and everything else will be sorted in the in the manners that uh, are usually used for that, uh, the, the, for these the, cases. So, right, the biggest opposition bloc in your parliament says normalization of relations with China must begin, and it must begin with the removal of Lance Burgess from the post of foreign minister. <laughs> the pressure on you is well, growing. <laughs> well, this is what the opposition does in any democratic country, and I'm glad that we're a democracy. Let's finish with that idea of you being a democracy. Throughout this conversation, you've stressed Lithuania's commitment to defending freedom and democracy in your own country across Europe. If you are to be credible and serious with that position, is it not time for Lithuania to look within, to look at the way it, over decades and decades, has refused to tell the truth about the story of what Lithuanians did to collaborate with the Nazis in the killing of Jews in the Second World War? Well, I think that Lithuania really is uh, taking the right steps in, in that regard. And uh, as history is extremely difficult for any country, we've learned our lessons uh, and we're making our amends. Well, have you been to your own museum, which used to be called the Genocide Museum, I think is now called the Museum of Occupation and Freedom Fighting, a museum which remarkably has one small room devoted to what happened to the Jews and how Lithuanians may have worked with the Nazis, but actually has three full floors all devoted to what is still called a genocide committed by the Soviets against your people. There doesn't appear to be a willingness to be truthful about how some of even your national heroes collaborated with the Nazis. Is it time to change? Well, I think that it's a, it's a healing process, and uh, it's the country has to heal from many wounds that it uh, that occurred in in for to the people uh, of our country, and it takes time. And I would love to see that going faster, but unfortunately, if that if we want that to be sustainable, we need uh, we need to allow uh, the country to heal. And I'm quite convinced that we will have some uh, good news in, in that regard when we're talking about the museums. We have to end there. Foreign Minister Landsbergis, thank you very much for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you for the questions.